Hey Bulldogs, Chris Bryant here in today's combination CCNP route and CCNA video boot camp. We're going to be jumping on the live equipment here in about 20 seconds and take a look at a scenario uh, that's so commonplace actually that there is a Cisco tech node on it. But at the same time, especially if you are relatively new or totally new to OSPF, it can really throw you because you learn all these rules about adjacencies and the different network types and the different router types and etc. And those of you working on the NP exam, you know how deep that gets as far as the areas and the route summarization and everything else. So it's a pretty simple setup. And actually, I've got it pre-configured here for us to take a look at. We've got one broadcast segment, one Ethernet network, and I've got four routers on it. Nothing tricky at all. And what I'm going to do is run show IP OSPF neighbor on the first one. Now, if you're not familiar with how this neighbor ID is arrived at, be sure to search my YouTube channel. I've got an uh, for the term OSPF RID. I've got a good video on that for you. Now, just a pop quiz. Looking at this router and assuming I have done nothing tricky, which I haven't, what is the OSPF role of this router? If you see one DR and you see two DR others on a broadcast segment, you know this is the backup designated router. Okay, so so far, you know, everything looks pretty darn normal. Let's go over to router two. And we know, let's see what we've got here. We've got a full adjacency, a full adjacency, and a two way adjacency. That seems a little odd. On router 3, we've got two full adjacencies and a two-way adjacency. And on router 4, we have three full adjacencies. So what the heck is going on here? This is really odd because everything looks fine. You know, there's no dead time issues, anything like that. Uh, and it's not that we have any dead adjacencies. We've just got this one that's here in two-way. And I can assure you it's been there for a couple of hours because I set this up earlier today and just came back to record it. So what's going on here? Well, the note that I mentioned that Cisco has out, and I'll bring that up in our browser, here's an IP routing note on Cisco's own website. Why does the show IP OSPF neighbor command reveal neighbors stuck in two-way? And that's generally how you, ref you hear this referred to it. It's stuck in two-way. Actually, this is the expected behavior. And it's actually desirable, believe it or not, because let's think about this for just a second at, at the big picture. If we've got router 1, and we know this is the backup designated router for the segment, you'll notice that it has full adjacencies to all other routers on the segment. Now, router 2, we know, is a DR other. So it has a full adjacency to the DR and to the BDR, but not to the other DR other on the segment. If we take a look at router 3, same situation. It's got a two-way adjacency to the other DR, and it has a full adjacency to the DR and BDR. And then finally, 4 are designated router for that segment. And remember, we have one DR per segment. It has a full adjacency to every other speaker on that segment. And the reason is, is that the DR, of course, has to have that full adjacency to all the other routers in case it needs to flood a change out. The BDR needs it because it needs to listen to those messages. It's got to have a full adjacency with every other speaker so it can keep its database up in case it needs to become the designated router very quickly. But there's no reason for the DR others to form full adjacencies with each other. It's really not necessary. It's, it would be a little extra overhead. And if we added another router to the segment right now, it would become a DR other and it would do the same thing. It would form a full adjacency with the DR, a full one with the BDR, and a two-way with the other ones. Now, with the other DR others. Now, the first time I saw this, I thought, well, why bother even going to two-way? You know, why, why not just not form an adjacency at all? And the reason for that is in case something changes on the network, say the DR goes down, then those two-way adjacencies are going to end up becoming full. As a matter of fact, we're going to go a little long here, and what I'm going to do is actually take router 4 out of this equation. And I will do this just by shutting that interface down. So we just lost our designated router. So we'll take this a little longer than five minutes today, but this is good for you to see. 
So we're expecting to see that. We were seeing that before, but we're going to lose that DR deal in just a second. Let me run neighbor there instead on router 2. And you see that dead time is still 15 seconds, so we will just hang out here for 15 seconds until it actually goes down. And then we'll see what happens to that two-way adjacency. It's just about gone. And now it is gone. So what we will likely see, what we'll hopefully see, is that two-way adjacency start to go, and you see it's already gone full just that quickly. So that's why the adjacency goes to two-way. Just in case it needs to become a full adjacency later on, it doesn't have to start at the very beginning. It's already worked its way up to two-way, and it can qu very quickly hit that full adjacency state. So it went over a little, little over our five-minute limit today, but definitely good stuff there for you to see again. By default, the DR will have an adjacency with every other segment, excuse me, every other router on that broadcast network. The BDR will have a full adjacency with every other router on the broadcast network, but the DR others will only have full adjacencies to the designated router and backup designated router. They will not form adjacencies with each other. They will stop at two-way. Thanks for watching today's video and for making TBA part of your Cisco certification success story.